Chapter Forty of Howard's End. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Howard's End by E. M. Forster, Chapter Forty. Leonard, he would figure at length in a newspaper report, but that evening he did not count for much. The foot of the tree was in shadow, since the moon was still hidden behind the house. But above, to right, to left, down the long meadow the moonlight was streaming. Leonard seemed not a man, but a cause. Perhaps it was Helen's way of falling in love, a curious way to Margaret, whose agony and whose contempt of Henry were yet imprinted with his image. Helen forgot people. They were husks that had enclosed her emotion. She could pity, or sacrifice herself, or have instincts. But had she ever loved in the noblest way, where man and woman, having lost themselves in sex, desire to lose sex itself in comradeship? Margaret wondered, but said no word of blame. This was Helen's evening. Troubles enough lay ahead of her. The loss of friends and of social advantages, the agony, the supreme agony of motherhood, which is even yet not a matter of common knowledge. For the present let the moon shine brightly, and the breezes of the spring blow gently, dying away from the gale of the day, and let the earth, who brings increase, bring peace. Not even to herself dare she blame Helen. She could not assess her trespass by any moral code. It was everything or nothing. Morality can tell us that murder is worse than stealing, and group most sins in an order all must approve. But it cannot group Helen. The surer its pronouncements on this point, the surer may we be that morality is not speaking. Christ was evasive when they questioned him. It is those that cannot connect who hasten to cast the first stone. This was Helen's evening, one at what cost and not to be marred by the sorrows of others. Of her own tragedy Margaret never uttered a word. One isolates, said Helen slowly. I isolated Mr. Wilcox from the other forces that were pulling Leonard downhill. Consequently I was full of pity and almost of revenge. For weeks I had blamed Mr. Wilcox only, and so when your letters came— I need never have written them, sighed Margaret. They never shielded Henry. How hopeless it is to tidy away the past even for others. I did not know that it was your own idea to dismiss the Basts. Looking back, that was wrong of me. Looking back, darling, I know that it was right. It is right to save the man whom one loves. I am less enthusiastic about justice now. But we both thought you wrote at his dictation. It seemed the last touch of his callousness. Being very much wrought up by this time, and Mrs. Bast was upstairs. I had not seen her, and had talked for a long time to Leonard. I had snubbed him for no reason, and that should have warned me I was in danger. So when the notes came, I wanted us to go to you for an explanation. He said that he guessed the explanation. He knew of it, and you mustn't know. I pressed him to tell me. He said no one must know. It was something to do with his wife. Right up to the end we were Mr. Bass and Miss Schlegel. I was going to tell him that he must be frank with me when I saw his eyes and guessed that Mr. Wilcox had ruined him in two ways, not one. I drew him to me. I made him tell me. I felt very lonely myself. He is not to blame. He would have gone on worshipping me. I want never to see him again, though it sounds appalling. I wanted to give him money and feel finished. Oh, Meg, the little that is known about these things. She laid her face against the tree. The little, too, that is known about growth. Both times it was loneliness and the night and panic afterwards. Did Leonard grow out of Paul? Margaret did not speak for a moment. So tired was she that her attention had actually wandered to the teeth, the teeth that had been thrust into the tree's bark to medicate it. From where she sat she could see them gleam. She had been trying to count them. Leonard is a better growth than madness, she said. I was afraid that you would react against Paul until you went over the verge. 
I did react until I found poor Leonard. I am steady now. I shan't ever like your Henry, dearest Meg, or even speak kindly about him. But all that blinding hate is over. I shall never rave against Wilcox's any more. I understand how you married him, and you will now be very happy. Margaret did not reply. Yes, repeated Helen, her voice growing more tender. I do at last understand. Except Mrs. Wilcox, dearest, no one understands our little movements. Because in death, I agree. Not quite. I feel that you and I and Henry are only fragments of that woman's mind. She knows everything. She is everything. She is the house and the tree that leans over it. People have their own deaths as well as their own lives, and even if there is nothing beyond death, we shall differ in our nothingness. I cannot believe that knowledge such as hers will perish with knowledge such as mine. She knew about realities. She knew when people were in love, though she was not in the room. I don't doubt that she knew when Henry deceived her. Good night, Mrs. Wilcox, called a voice. Oh, good night, Miss Avery. Why should Miss Avery work for us? Helen murmured. Why, indeed? Miss Avery crossed the lawn and merged into the hedge that divided it from the farm. An old gap which Mr. Wilcox had filled up had reappeared, and her track through the dew followed the path that he had turfed over when he improved the garden and made it possible for games. This is not quite our house yet, said Helen. When Miss Avery called, I felt we are only a couple of tourists. We shall be that everywhere, and forever. But affectionate tourists, but tourists who pretend that each hotel is their home. I can't pretend very long, said Helen. Sitting under this tree one forgets, but I know that tomorrow I shall see the moon rise out of Germany. Not all your goodness can alter the facts of the case, unless you will come with me. Margaret thought for a moment. In the past year she had grown so fond of England that to leave it was a real grief. Yet what detained her? No doubt Henry would pardon her outburst and go on blustering and muddling into a ripe old age. But what was the good? She had just as soon vanish from his mind. Are you serious in asking me, Helen? Should I get on with your Monica? You would not. But I am serious in asking you. Still, no more plans now, and no more reminiscences. They were silent for a little. It was Helen's evening. The present flowed by them like a stream. The tree rustled. It had made music before they were born and would continue after their deaths, but its song was of the moment. The moment had passed. The tree rustled again. Their senses were sharpened, and they seemed to apprehend life. Life passed. The tree nestled again. Sleep now, said Margaret. The peace of the country was entering into her. It has no commerce with memory and little with hope least of all is it concerned with the hopes of the next five minutes. It is the peace of the present which passes understanding. Its murmur came now, and now once more as they trod the gravel, and now as the moonlight fell upon their father's sword. They passed upstairs, kissed, and amidst the endless iterations fell asleep. The house had enshadowed the tree at first, but as the moon rose higher the two disentangled, and were clear for a few moments at midnight. Margaret awoke and looked into the garden. How incomprehensible that Leonard Bast should have won her this night of peace! Was he also part of Mrs. Wilcox's mind? End of chapter 40 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 41 of Howard's End. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter 41. Far different was Leonard's development. The months after Onaton, whatever minor troubles they might bring him, were all overshadowed by remorse. When Helen looked back she could philosophize, or she could look into the future and plan for her child. But the father saw nothing beyond his own sin. 
Weeks afterwards, in the midst of other occupations, he would suddenly cry out, Brute! You brute! I couldn't have! And be rent into two people who held dialogues. Or brown rain would descend, blotting out faces in the sky. Even Jackie noticed the change in him. Most terrible were his sufferings when he awoke from sleep. Sometimes he was happy at first, but grew conscious of a burden hanging to him and weighing down his thoughts when they would move. Or little iron scorched his body, or a sword stabbed him. He would sit at the edge of his bed, holding his heart and moaning, Oh, what shall I do? Whatever shall I do? Nothing brought ease. He could put distance between him and the trespass, but it grew in his soul. Remorse is not among the eternal verities. The Greeks were right to dethrone her. Her action is too capricious, as though the Aranyes selected for punishment only certain men and certain sins. And of all means to regeneration, remorse is surely the most wasteful. It cuts away healthy tissues with the poisoned. It is a knife that probes far deeper than the evil. Leonard was driven straight through its torments and emerged pure, but enfeebled. A better man, who would never lose control of himself again, but also a smaller, who had less to control. Nor did purity mean peace. The use of the knife can become a habit as hard to shake off as passion itself, and Leonard continued to start with a cry out of dreams. He built up a situation that was far enough from the truth. It never occurred to him that Helen was to blame. He forgot the intensity of their talk, the charm that had been lent him by sincerity, the magic of Onaton under darkness and of the whispering river. Helen loved the absolute. Leonard had been ruined absolutely and had appeared to her as a man apart, isolated from the world. A real man who cared for adventure and beauty, who desired to live decently and pay his way, who could have travelled more gloriously through life than the juggernaut car that was crushing him. Memories of Evie's wedding had warped her. The starched servants, the yards of uneaten food, the rustle of overdressed women, motor cars oozing grease on the gravel, rubbish on a pretentious band. She had tasted the lees of this on her arrival in the darkness. After failure, they intoxicated her. She and the victim seemed alone in a world of unreality, and she loved him absolutely, perhaps for half an hour. In the morning she was gone. The note that she left, tender and hysterical in tone, and intended to be most kind, hurt her lover terribly. It was as if some work of art had been broken by him, some picture in the National Gallery slashed out of its frame. When he recalled her talents and her social position, he felt that the first passer-by had a right to shoot him down. He was afraid of the waitress and the porters at the railway station. He was afraid at first of his wife, though later he was to regard her with a strange new tenderness, and to think, there is nothing to choose between us after all. The expedition to Shropshire crippled the Basts permanently. Helen in her flight forgot to settle the hotel bill and took their return tickets away with her. They had to pawn Jackie's bangles to get home, and the smash came a few days afterwards. It is true that Helen offered him five thousand pounds but such a sum meant nothing to him. He could not see that the girl was desperately riding herself and trying to save something out of the disaster, if it was only five thousand pounds. But he had to live somehow. He turned to his family and degraded himself to a professional beggar. There was nothing else for him to do. A letter from Leonard, thought Blanche his sister, and after all this time. She hid it so that her husband should not see and when he had gone to his work read it with some emotion, and sent the prodigal a little money out of her dress allowance. A letter from Leonard, said the other sister Laura a few days later. She showed it to her husband. He wrote a cruel, insolent reply, but sent more money than Blanche, so Leonard soon wrote to him again. And during the winter the system was developed. Leonard realized that they need never starve, because it would be too painful for his relatives. Society is based on the family, and the clever wastrel can exploit this indefinitely. Without a generous thought on either side, pounds and pounds passed. The donors disliked Leonard, and he grew to hate them intensely. When Laura censured his immoral marriage, he thought bitterly, she minds that. What would she say if she knew the truth? 
When Blanche's husband offered him work, he found some pretext for avoiding it. He had wanted work keenly at Oniton, but too much anxiety had shattered him. He was joining the unemployable. When his brother the lay reader did not reply to a letter, he wrote again, saying that he and Jackie would come down to his village on foot. He did not intend this as blackmail. Still the brother sent a postal order, and it became part of the system. And so passed his winter, and his spring. In the horror there are two bright spots. He never confused the past. He remained alive, and blessed are those who live, if it is only to a sense of sinfulness. The anodyne of muddledom, by which most men blur and blend their mistakes, never passed Leonard's lips. And if I drink oblivion of a day, so shorten I the stature of my soul. It is a hard saying. And a hard man wrote it, but it lies at the foot of all character. And the other bright spot was his tenderness for Jackie. He pitied her with nobility now, not the contemptuous pity of a man who sticks to a woman through thick and thin. He tried to be less irritable. He wondered what her hungry eyes desired. Nothing that she could express, or that he or any man could give her. Would she ever receive the justice that is mercy, the justice for by-products that the world is too busy to bestow? She was fond of flowers, generous with money, and not revengeful. If she had borne him a child, he might have cared for her. Unmarried, Leonard would never have begged. He would have flickered out and died. But the whole of life is mixed. He had to provide for Jackie and went down dirty paths that she might have a few feathers and dishes of food that suited her. One day he caught sight of Margaret and her brother. He was in St. Paul's. He had entered the cathedral partly to avoid the rain and partly to see a picture that had educated him in former years. But the light was bad, the picture ill-placed, and time and judgment were inside him now. Death alone still charmed him with her lap of poppies on which all men shall sleep. He took one glance and turned aimlessly away towards a chair. Then down the nave he saw Miss Schlegel and her brother. They stood in the fairway of passengers, and their faces were extremely grave. He was perfectly certain that they were in trouble about their sister. Once outside, and he fled immediately, he wished that he had spoken to them. What was his life? What were a few angry words or even imprisonment? He had done wrong. That was the true terror. Whatever they might know, he would tell them everything he knew. He re-entered St. Paul's. But they had moved in his absence, and had gone to lay their difficulties before Mr. Wilcox and Charles. The sight of Margaret turned remorse into new channels. He desired to confess, and though the desire is proof of a weakened nature, which is about to lose the essence of human intercourse, it did not take an ignoble form. He did not suppose that confession would bring him happiness. It was rather that he yearned to get clear of the tangle. So does the suicide yearn. The impulses are akin and the crime of suicide lies rather in its disregard for the feelings of those whom we leave behind. Confession need harm no one. It can satisfy that test. And though it was un-English and ignored by our Anglican cathedral, Leonard had a right to decide upon it. Moreover, he trusted Margaret. He wanted her hardness now. That cold, intellectual nature of hers would be just, if unkind. He would do whatever she told him, even if he had to see Helen. That was the supreme punishment she would exact. And perhaps she would tell him how Helen was. That was the supreme reward. He knew nothing about Margaret, not even whether she was married to Mr. Wilcox, and tracking her out took several days. That evening he toiled through the wet to Wickham Place, where the new flats were now appearing. Was he also the cause of their move? Were they expelled from society on his account? thence to a public library, but could find no satisfactory Schlegel in the directory. On the morrow he searched again. He hung about outside Mr. Wilcox's office at lunchtime, and as the clerks came out said, "'Excuse me, sir, but is your boss married?' Most of them stared. Some said, "'What's that to you?' But one, who had not yet acquired reticence, told him what he wished. Leonard could not learn the private address. That necessitated more trouble with directories and tubes. Ducey Street was not discovered till the Monday, the day that Margaret and her husband went down on their hunting expedition to Howard's End. He called at about four o'clock. The weather had changed, and the sun shone gaily on the ornamental steps, 
black and white marble and triangles. Leonard lowered his eyes to them after ringing the bell. He felt in curious health. Doors seemed to be opening and shutting inside his body, and he had been obliged to sleep sitting up in bed with his back propped against the wall. When the parlour-maid came he could not see her face. The brown rain had descended suddenly. "'Does Mrs. Wilcox live here?' he asked. "'She's out,' was the answer. "'When will she be back?' "'I'll ask,' said the parlour-maid. Margaret had given instructions that no one who mentioned her name should ever be rebuffed. Putting the door on the chain, for Leonard's appearance demanded this, she went through to the smoking-room which was occupied by Tibby. Tibby was asleep. He had had a good lunch. Charles Wilcox had not yet rung him up for the distracting interview. He said drowsily, "'I don't know, Hilton. Howard's end. Who is it?' "'I'll ask, sir.' "'No, don't bother.' "'They have taken the car to Howard's end,' said the parlour-maid to Leonard. He thanked her and asked whereabouts that place was. "'You appear to want to know a good deal,' she remarked. But Margaret had forbidden her to be mysterious. She told him against her better judgment that Howard's End was in Herefordshire. "'Is it a village, please?' "'Village! It's Mr. Wilcox's private house. At least, it's one of them. Mrs. Wilcox keeps her furniture there. Hilton is the village.' Yes. And when will they be back? Mr. Schlegel doesn't know. We can't know everything, can we? She shut him out and went to attend to the telephone which was ringing furiously. He loitered away another night of agony. Confession grew more difficult. As soon as possible he went to bed. He watched a patch of moonlight cross the floor of their lodging, and as sometimes happens when the mind is overtaxed, he fell asleep for the rest of the room, but kept awake for the patch of moonlight. Horrible. Then began one of those disintegrating dialogues. Part of him said, Why horrible? It's ordinary light from the room. But it moves. So does the moon. But it is a clenched fist. Why not? But it is going to touch me. Let it. And seeming to gather motion, the patch ran up his blanket. Presently a blue snake appeared, then another parallel to it. Is there life in the moon? Of course but I thought it was uninhabited, not by time, death, judgment, and the smaller snakes. Smaller snakes, said Leonard in dignity and aloud. What a notion! By a rending effort of the will he woke the rest of the room up. Jackie, the bed, their food, their clothes on the chair gradually entered his consciousness, and the horror vanished outwards like a ring that is spreading through water. I say, Jackie, I'm going out for a bit. She was breathing regularly. The patch of light fell clear of the striped blanket and began to cover the shawl that lay over her feet. Why had he been afraid? He went to the window and saw that the moon was descending through a clear sky. He saw her volcanoes and the bright expanses that a gracious error has named seas. They paled, for the sun who had lit them up was coming to light the earth. Sea of serenity, sea of tranquillity ocean of the lunar storms merged into one lucent drop, itself to slip into the sempiternal dawn. And he had been afraid of the moon. He dressed among the contending lights and went through his money. It was running low again, but enough for return ticket to Hilton. As it clinked, Jackie opened her eyes. Hello, Lynn. What ho, Lynn. What ho, Jackie. See you again later. She turned over and slept. The house was unlocked, their landlord being a salesman at Convent Garden. Leonard passed out and made his way down to the station. The train, though it did not start for an hour, was already drawn up at the end of the platform, and he lay down in it and slept. With the first jolt he was in daylight. They had left the gateways of King's Cross and were under blue sky. Tunnels followed, and after each the sky grew bluer, and from the embankment at Finsbury Park he had his first sight of the sun. It rolled along behind the eastern smokes, a wheel whose fellow was the descending moon. And as yet it seemed the servant of the blue sky, not its lord. He dozed again. Over two in water it was day. To the left fell the shadow of the embankment and its arches. To the right Leonard saw up into the two in woods and towards the church with its wild legend of immortality. Six forest trees, that is a fact, grow out of one of the graves in two in churchyard. 
The grave's occupant, that is the legend, is an atheist who declared that if God existed six forest trees would grow out of her grave. These things in Herefordshire, and farther afield, lay the house of a hermit. Mrs. Wilcox, who had known him, who barred himself up, and wrote prophecies and gave all he had to the poor, while powdered in between were the villas of businessmen who saw life more steadily, though with the steadiness of the half-closed eye. Over all the sun was streaming, to all the birds were singing, to all the primroses were yellow, and the speedwell blue, and the country, however, they interpreted her, was uttering her cry of now. She did not free Leonard yet, and the knife plunged deeper into his heart as the train drew up at Hilton. But remorse had become beautiful. Hilton was asleep, or at the earliest breakfasting. Leonard noticed the contrast when he stepped out of it into the country. Here men had been up since dawn. Their hours were ruled not by a London office, but by the movements of the crops and the sun. That they were men of the finest type only the sentimentalist can declare. But they kept to the life of daylight. They are England's hope. Clumsily they carry forward the torch of the sun until such time as the nation sees fit to take it up. Half clodhopper, half board school prig, they can still throw back to a nobler stock and breed yeomen. At the chalk pit a motor passed him. In it was another type, whom nature favors, the imperial. Healthy, ever in motion it hopes to inherit the earth. It breeds as quickly as the yeoman and as soundly, strong is the temptation to acclaim it as a super yeoman, who carries his country's virtue overseas. But the imperialist is not what he thinks or seems. He is a destroyer. He prepares the way for cosmopolitanism, and though his ambitions may be fulfilled, the earth that he inherits will be grey. To Leonard, intent on his private sin, there came the conviction of innate goodness elsewhere. It was not the optimism which he had been taught at school. Again and again must the drums tap and the goblins stalk over the universe before joy can be purged of the superficial. It was rather paradoxical and arose from his sorrow. Death destroys a man, but the idea of death saves him. That is the best account of it that has yet been given. Squalor and tragedy can beckon to all that is great in us and strengthen the wings of love. They can beckon, it is not certain that they will, for they are not love's servants. But they can beckon, and the knowledge of this incredible truth comforted him. As he approached the house all thought stopped. Contradictory notions stood side by side in his mind. He was terrified but happy, ashamed but had done no sin. He knew the confession. Mrs. Wilcox, I have done wrong. But sunrise had robbed its meaning, and he felt rather on a supreme adventure. He entered a garden, steadied himself against a motor-car that he found in it, found a door open and entered a house. Yes, it would be very easy. From a room to the left he heard voices, Margaret's amongst them. His own name was called aloud, and a man whom he had never seen said, Oh, is he there? I am not surprised. I now thrash him within an inch of his life. Mrs. Wilcox, said Leonard, I have done wrong. The man took him by the collar and cried, Bring me a stick. Women were screaming. A stick, very bright, descended. It hurt him, not where it descended, but in the heart. Books fell over him in a shower. Nothing had sense. Get some water, commanded Charles, who had all through kept very calm. He's shamming. Of course I only use the blade. Here, carry him out into the air. Thinking that he understood these things, Margaret obeyed him. They laid Leonard, who was dead, on the gravel. Helen poured water over him. That's enough, said Charles. Yes, murder's enough, said Miss Avery, coming out of the house with the sword. End of chapter 41 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 42 of Howard's End This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 42 When Charles left Dukey Street, he had caught the first train home, but had no inkling of the newest development until late at night. 
Then his father, who had dined alone, sent for him, and in very grave tones inquired for Margaret. "'I don't know where she is, Pater,' said Charles. "'Dolly kept back dinner nearly an hour for her. "'Tell me when she comes in.' Another hour passed. The servants went to bed, and Charles visited his father again to receive further instructions. Mrs. Wilcox had still not returned. "'I'll sit up for her as late as you like, but she can hardly be coming. Isn't she stopping with her sister at the hotel?' Perhaps, said Mr. Wilcox thoughtfully. Perhaps. Can I do anything for you, sir? Not tonight, my boy. Mr. Wilcox liked being called sir. He raised his eyes and gave his son more open a look of tenderness than he usually ventured. He saw Charles as a little boy and strong man in one. Though his wife had proved unstable, his children were left to him. After midnight he tapped on Charles's door. "'I can't sleep,' he said. "'I had better have a talk with you and get it over.' He complained of the heat. Charles took him out into the garden, and as they paced up and down in their dressing gowns, Charles became very quiet as the story unrolled. He had known all along that Margaret was as bad as her sister. "'She will feel differently in the morning,' said Mr. Wilcox, who had, of course, said nothing about Mrs. Bast. "'But I cannot let this kind of thing continue without comment. I am morally certain that she is with her sister at Howard's End. The house is mine, and, Charles, it will be yours. And when I say that no one is to live there, I mean that no one is to live there. I won't have it.' He looked angrily at the moon. To my mind this question is connected with something far greater, the rights of property itself. Undoubtedly, said Charles. Mr. Wilcox linked his arm in his son's, but somehow liked him less as he told him more. I don't want you to conclude that my wife and I had anything of the nature of a quarrel. She was only overwrought, as who would not be. I shall do what I can for Helen but on the understanding that they clear out of the house at once. Do you see? That is a sine qua non. Then at eight tomorrow I may go up in the car. Eight, or earlier. Say that you are acting as my representative, and, of course, use no violence, Charles. On the morrow, as Charles returned, leaving Leonard dead upon the gravel, it did not seem to him that he had used violence. Death was due to heart disease. His stepmother herself had said so, and even Miss Avery had acknowledged that he only used the flat of the sword. On his way through the village he informed the police who thanked him and said there must be an inquest. He found his father in the garden shading his eyes from the sun. "'It has been pretty horrible,' said Charles gravely. "'They were there, and they had the man up there with them, too. "'What? What man?' I told you last night. His name was Bast. My God, is it possible, said Mr. Wilcox, in your mother's house. Charles, in your mother's house. I know, Pater. That was what I felt. As a matter of fact, there is no need to trouble about the man. He was in the last stages of heart disease, and just before I could show him what I thought of him, he went off. The police are seeing about it at this moment. Mr. Wilcox listened attentively. I got up there. Oh, it couldn't have been more than half-past seven. The Avery woman was lighting a fire for them. They were still upstairs. I waited in the drawing-room. We were all moderately civil and collected, though I had my suspicions. I gave them your message, and Mrs. Wilcox said, Oh, yes, I see. Yes, in that way of hers. Nothing else. I promised to tell you, with her love, that she was going to Germany with her sister this evening. That was all we had time for. Mr. Wilcox seemed relieved. Because by then I suppose the man got tired of hiding, for suddenly Mrs. Wilcox screamed out his name. I recognized it, and I went for him in the hall. Was I right, Pater? I thought things were going a little too far. Right, my dear boy? I don't know. 
but you would have been no son of mine if you hadn't. Then did he just, just crumple up, as you said? He shrunk from the simple word. He caught hold of the bookcase which came down over him. So I merely put the sword down and carried him into the garden. We all thought he was shamming. However, he's dead right enough. Awful business. Sword, cried his father with anxiety in his voice. What sword? Whose sword? A sword of theirs. What were you doing with it? Well, didn't you see, Pater, I had to snatch up the first thing handy. I hadn't a riding whip or stick. I caught him once or twice over the shoulders with the flat of their old German sword. Then what? He pulled over the bookcase, as I said, and fell, said Charles with a sigh. It was no fun doing errands for his father, who was never quite satisfied. But the real cause was heart disease? Of that you're sure? That or a fit? However, we shall hear more than enough at the inquest on such unsavory topics. They went into breakfast. Charles had a racking headache consequent on motoring before food. He was also anxious about the future, reflecting that the police must detain Helen and Margaret for the inquest and ferret the whole thing out. He saw himself obliged to leave Hilton. One could not afford to live near the scene of a scandal. It was not fair on one's wife. His comfort was that the pater's eyes were opened at last. There would be a horrible smash-up and probably a separation from Margaret. Then they would all start again, more as they had been in his mother's time. "'I think I'll go round to the police station,' said his father when breakfast was over. "'What for?' cried Dolly, who had still not been told. "'Very well, sir. Which car will you have? I think I'll walk.' It's a good half-mile, said Charles, stepping into the garden. The sun's very hot for April. Shan't I take you up, and then perhaps a little spin round by Tewin? You go on as if I didn't know my own mind, said Mr. Wilcox fretfully. Charles hardened his mouth. You young fellows one idea is to get into a motor. I tell you, I want to walk. I'm very fond of walking. Oh, all right. I'm about the house if you want me for anything. I thought of not going up to the office to-day, if that is your wish. It is indeed, my boy, said Mr. Wilcox, and laid a hand on his sleeve. Charles did not like it. He was uneasy about his father, who did not seem himself this morning. There was a petulant touch about him, more like a woman. Could it be that he was growing old? The Wilcoxes were not lacking in affection. They had it royally. But they did not know how to use it. It was the talent in the napkin and for a warm-hearted man Charles had conveyed very little joy. As he watched his father shuffling up the road he had a vague regret, a wish that something had been different somewhere, a wish, though he did not express it thus, that he had been taught to say I in his youth. He meant to make up for Margaret's defection, but knew that his father had been very happy with her until yesterday. How had she done it? By some dishonest trick, no doubt. But how? Mr. Wilcox reappeared at eleven, looking very tired. There was to be an inquest on Leonard's body tomorrow, and the police required his son to attend. I expected that, said Charles. I shall naturally be the most important witness there. End of chapter 42 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 43 of Howard's End. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter 43. Out of the turmoil and horror that had begun with Aunt Julie's illness and was not even to end with Leonard's death, it seemed impossible to Margaret that healthy life should re emerge. Events succeeded in a logical yet senseless train. People lost their humanity and took values as arbitrary as those in a pack of playing cards. It was natural that Henry should do this and cause Helen to do that, and then think her wrong for doing it. Natural that she herself should think him wrong. Natural that Leonard should want to know how Helen was, and come, and Charles be angry with him for coming. Natural, but unreal. 
In this jangle of causes and effects, what had become of their true selves? Here Leonard lay dead in the garden from natural causes, yet life was a deep, deep river, death a blue sky, life was a house, death a wisp of hay, a flower, a tower. Life and death were anything and everything except this ordered insanity where the king takes the queen and the ace the king. Ah, no, there was beauty and adventure behind such as the man at her feet had yearned for. There was hope this side of the grave. There were truer relationships beyond the limits that fetter us now. As a prisoner looks up and sees stars beckoning, so she, from the turmoil and horror of those days, caught glimpses of the diviner wheels. And Helen, dumb with fright, but trying to keep calm for the child's sake, and Miss Avery, calm but murmuring tenderly, no one ever told the lad he'll have a child, they also reminded her that horror is not the end. To what ultimate harmony we tend she did not know. But there seemed great chance that a child would be born into the world to take the great chances of beauty and adventure that the world offers. She moved through the sunlit garden, gathering narcissi, crimson-eyed and white. There was nothing else to be done. The time for telegrams and anger was over, and it seemed wisest that the hands of Leonard should be folded on his breast and be filled with flowers. Here was the father, leave it at that. Let squalor be turned into tragedy, whose eyes are the stars, and whose hands hold the sunset and the dawn. And even the influx of officials, even the return of the doctor, vulgar and acute, could not shake her belief in the eternity of beauty. Science explained people, but could not understand them. After long centuries among the bones and muscles, it might be advancing to knowledge of the nerves, but this would never give understanding. One could open the heart to Mr. Mansbridge and his sort without discovering its secrets to them, for they wanted everything down in black and white, and black and white was exactly what they were left with. They questioned her closely about Charles. She never suspected why. Death had come, and the doctor agreed it was due to heart disease. They asked to see her father's sword. She explained that Charles's anger was natural but mistaken. Miserable questions about Leonard followed, all of which she answered unfalteringly. Then back to Charles again. No doubt Mr. Wilcox may have induced death, she said. But if it wasn't one thing, it would have been another, as you yourselves know. At last they thanked her and took the sword and the body down to Hilton. She began to pick up the books from the floor. Helen had gone to the farm. It was the best place for her since she had to wait for the inquest. Though, as if things were not hard enough, Madge and her husband had raised trouble. They did not see why they should receive the off-scourings of Howard's End. And of course they were right. The whole world was going to be right and amply avenge any brave talk against the conventions. Nothing matters, the Schlegels had said in the past, except one's self-respect and that of one's friends. When the time came, other things mattered terribly. However, Madge had yielded, and Helen was assured of peace for one day, and night, and tomorrow she would return to Germany. As for herself, she determined to go, too. No message came from Henry. Perhaps he expected her to apologize. Now that she had time to think over her own tragedy, she was unrepentant. She neither forgave him for his behavior, nor wished to forgive him. Her speech to him seemed perfect. She would not have altered a word. It had to be uttered once in a life to adjust the lopsidedness of the world. It was spoken not only to her husband, but to thousands of men like him, a protest against the inner darkness in high places that comes with a commercial age. Though he would build up his life without hers, she could not apologize. He had refused to connect, on the clearest issue that can be laid before a man, and their love must take the consequences. No, there was nothing more to be done. They had tried not to go over the precipice, but perhaps the fall was inevitable, and it comforted her to think that the future was certainly inevitable. Cause and effect would go jangling forward to some goal doubtless, but to none that she could imagine. At such moments the soul retires within to float upon the bosom of a deeper stream, and has communion with the dead and sees the world's glory not diminished, 
but different in kind to what she has supposed. She alters her focus until trivial things are blurred. Margaret had been tending this way all the winter. Leonard's death brought her to the goal. Alas, that Henry should fade away as reality emerged, and only her love for him should remain clear, stamped with his image like the cameos we rescue out of dreams. With unfaltering eyes she traced his future. He would soon present a healthy mind to the world again, and what did he or the world care if he was rotten at the core? He would grow into a rich, jolly old man, at times a little sentimental about women, but emptying his glass with any one. Tenacious of power, he would keep Charles and the rest dependent, and retire from business reluctantly and at an advanced age. He would settle down, though she could not realize this. In her eyes, Henry was always moving and causing others to move until the ends of the earth met. But in time, he must get too tired to move and settle down. What next? The inevitable word. The release of the soul to its appropriate heaven. Would they meet in it? Margaret believed in immortality for herself. An eternal future had always seemed natural to her. And Henry believed in it for himself. Yet... Would they meet again? Are there not rather endless levels beyond the grave as the theory that he had censured teaches? And his level, whether higher or lower, could it possibly be the same as hers? Thus gravely meditating, she was summoned by him. He sent up Crane in the motor. Other servants passed like water, but the chauffeur remained, though impertinent and disloyal. Margaret disliked Crane, and he knew it. Is it the keys that Mr. Wilcox wants? she asked. He didn't say, madam. You haven't any note for me? He didn't say, madam. After a moment's thought she locked up Howard's end. It was pitiable to see in it the stirrings of warmth that would be quenched forever. She raked out the fire that was blazing in the kitchen, and spread the coals in the graveled yard. She closed the windows and drew the curtains. Henry would probably sell the place now. She was determined not to spare him, for nothing new had happened as far as they were concerned. Her mood might never have altered from yesterday evening. He was standing a little outside Charles's gate and motioned the car to stop. When his wife got out, he said hoarsely, I prefer to discuss things with you outside. It will be more appropriate in the road, I am afraid, said Margaret. Did you get my message? What about? I am going to Germany with my sister. I must tell you now that I shall make it my permanent home. Our talk last night was more important than you have realized. I am unable to forgive you and am leaving you. I am extremely tired, said Henry in injured tones. I have been walking about all the morning and wish to sit down. Certainly, if you will consent to sit on the grass. The great northern road should have been bordered all its length with glebe. Henry's kind had filched most of it. She moved to the scrap opposite wherein were the six hills. They sat down on the farther side so they could not be seen by Charles or Dolly. Here are your keys, said Margaret. She tossed them towards him. They fell on the sunlit slope of grass and he did not pick them up. I have something to tell you, he said gently. She knew this superficial gentleness, this confession of hastiness, that was only intended to enhance her admiration of the male. I don't want to hear it, she replied. My sister is going to be ill. My life is going to be with her now. We must manage to build up something, she and I and her child. Where are you going? Munich. We start after the inquest, if she is not too ill. After the inquest? Yes. Have you realized what the verdict at the inquest will be? Yes. Heart disease. No, my dear. Manslaughter. Margaret drove her fingers through the grass. The hill beneath her moved as if it was alive. Manslaughter, repeated Mr. Wilcox. Charles may go to prison. I dare not tell him. I don't know what to do. What to do? I'm broken. I'm ended. No sudden warmth arose in her. She did not see that to break him was her only hope. She did not enfold the sufferer in her arms. But all through that day and the next a new life began to move. The verdict was brought in. Charles was committed for trial. It was against all reason that he should be punished, but the law, being made in his image, sentenced him to three years' imprisonment. 
Then Henry's fortress gave way. He could bear no one but his wife. He shambled up to Margaret afterwards and asked her to do what she could with him. She did what seemed easiest. She took him down to recruit at Howard's End. End of chapter 43 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 44 of Howard's End. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter 44. Tom's father was cutting the big meadow. He passed again and again amid whirring blades and sweet odors of grass encompassing with narrow circles the sacred center of the field. Tom was negotiating with Helen. I haven't any idea, she replied. Do you suppose baby may, Meg? Margaret put down her work and regarded them absently. What was that? she asked. Tom wants to know whether baby is old enough to play with hay. I haven't the least notion, answered Margaret, and took up her work again. Now, Tom, baby is not to stand. He is not to lie on his face. He is not to lie so that his head wags. He is not to be teased or tickled and he is not to be cut into two or more pieces by the cutter. Will you be as careful as all that? Tom held out his arms. That child is a wonderful nursemaid, remarked Margaret. He is fond of baby. That's why he does it, was Helen's answer. They're going to be lifelong friends. Starting at the ages of six and one? Of course. It will be a great thing for Tom. It may be a greater thing for baby. Fourteen months had passed, but Margaret still stopped at Howard's End. No better plan had occurred to her. The meadow was being recut, the great red poppies were reopening in the garden. July would follow with the little red poppies among the wheat, August with the cutting of the wheat. These little events would become part of her year after year. Every summer she would fear lest the well should give out, every winter lest the pipes should freeze. Every westerly gale might blow the witch-elm down and bring the end of all things. And so she could not read or talk during a westerly gale. The air was tranquil now. She and her sister were sitting on the remains of Evie's mockery, where the lawn merged into the field. "'What a time they all are,' said Helen. "'What can they be doing inside?' Margaret, who was growing less talkative, made no answer. The noise of the cutter came intermittently like the breaking of waves. Close by them a man was preparing to scythe out one of the dell-holes. "'I wish Henry was out to enjoy this,' said Helen. "'This lovely weather and to be shut up in the house. It's very hard.' "'It has to be,' said Margaret. "'The hay fever is his chief objection against living here, but he thinks it worth while. "'Meg, is or isn't he ill? I can't make out.' "'Not ill.' eternally tired. He has worked very hard all his life and noticed nothing. Those are the people who collapse when they do notice a thing. I suppose he worries dreadfully about his part of the tangle? Dreadfully. That is why I wish Dolly had not come, too, today. Still, he wanted them all to come. It has to be. Why does he want them? Margaret did not answer. Meg, may I tell you something? I like Henry. "'You'd be odd if you didn't,' said Margaret. "'I usen't to.' "'Usen't? She lowered her eyes a moment to the black abyss of the past. They had crossed it, always excepting Leonard and Charles. They were building up a new life, obscure, yet gilded with tranquillity. Leonard was dead. Charles had two years more in prison. One usen't always to see clearly before that time. It was different now.' I like Henry because he does worry. And he likes you because you don't. Helen sighed. She seemed humiliated and buried her face in her hands. After a time, she said, Above love. A transition less abrupt than it appeared. Margaret never stopped working. I mean, a woman's love for a man. I supposed I should hang my life onto that once and was driven up and down and about as if something was worrying through me. But everything is peaceful now. I seem cured. That Herr Forstmeister, whom Frieda keeps writing about, must be a noble character, but he doesn't see that I shall never marry him or anyone. It isn't shame or mistrust of myself. 
I simply couldn't. I mended. I used to be so dreamy about a man's love as a girl, and I think that for good or evil love must be the great thing. But it hasn't been. It has been itself a dream. Do you agree? I do not agree. I do not. I ought to remember Leonard as my lover, said Helen, stepping down into the field. I tempted him and killed him, and it is surely the least I can do. I would like to throw out all my heart to Leonard on such an afternoon as this, but I cannot. It is no good pretending. I am forgetting him. Her eyes filled with tears. How nothing seems to match. How, my darling, my precious. She broke off. Tommy? Yes, please. Baby's not to try and stand. There's something wanting in me. I see you loving Henry and understanding him better daily, and I know that death wouldn't part you in the least. But I— Is it something awful appalling? Criminal defect? Margaret silenced her. She said, It is only that people are far more different than is pretended. All over the world men and women are worrying because they cannot develop as they are supposed to develop. Here and there they have the matter out, and it comforts them. Don't fret yourself, Helen. Develop what you have— love your child. I do not love children. I am thankful to have none. I can play with their beauty and charm, but that is all. Nothing real. Not one scrap of what there ought to be. And others, others go farther still and move outside humanity altogether. A place, as well as a person, may catch the glow. Don't you see that all this leads to comfort in the end? It is part of the battle against sameness. Differences, eternal differences planted by God in a single family, so that there may always be color. Sorrow, perhaps, but color in the daily gray. Then I can't have you worrying about Leonard. Don't drag in the personal when it will not come. Forget him. Yes. Yes. But what has Leonard got out of life? Perhaps an adventure. Is that enough? Not for us, but for him. Helen took up a bunch of grass. She looked at the sorrel and the red and white and yellow clover, and the Quaker grass and the daisies and the bents that composed it. She raised it to her face. "'Is it sweetening yet?' asked Margaret. "'No, only withered. It will sweeten to-morrow.' Helen smiled. "'Oh, Meg, you are a person,' she said. "'Think of the racket and torture this time last year. But now—' I couldn't stop unhappy if I tried. What a change! And all through you. Oh, we merely settled down. You and Henry learnt to understand one another and to forgive, all through the autumn and the winter. Yes, but who settled us down? Margaret did not reply. The scything had begun, and she took off her pince nez to watch it. You! cried Helen. You did it all, sweetest, though you're too stupid to see. Living here was your plan. I wanted you, he wanted you, and everyone said it was impossible. But you knew. Just think of our lives without you, Meg, I and Baby with Monica, revolting by theory, he handed about from Dolly to Evie. But you picked up the pieces and made us a home. Can't it strike you even for a moment that your life has been heroic? Can't you remember the two months after Charles's arrest when you began to act and did all? You were both ill at the time, said Margaret. I did the obvious things. I had two invalids to nurse. Here was a house ready furnished and empty. It was obvious. I didn't know myself it would turn into a permanent home. No doubt I have done a little toward straightening the tangle, but things that I can't phrase have helped me. I hope it will be permanent, said Helen, drifting away to other thoughts. I think so. There are moments when I feel Howard's in peculiarly our own. All the same, London's creeping. She pointed over the meadow, over eight or nine meadows, but at the end of them was a red rust. You see that in Surrey and even in Hampshire now, she continued. I can see it from the Purebeck Downs. And London is only part of something else, I'm afraid. Life's going to be melted down all over the world. Margaret knew that her sister spoke truly. Howard's Inn, Oniton, the Purebeck Downs, the Oderberge, were all survivals, 
and the melting pot was being prepared for them. Logically, they had no right to be alive. One's hope was in the weakness of logic. Were they possibly the earth beating time? Because a thing is going strong now, it need not go strong forever, she said. This craze for motion has only set in during the last hundred years. It may be followed by a civilization that won't be a movement, because it will rest on the earth. All the signs are against it now, but I can't help hoping, and very early in the morning in the garden I feel that our house is the future, as well as the past. They turned and looked at it. Their own memories colored it now, for Helen's child had been born in the central room of the Nine. Then Margaret said, Oh, take care, for something moved behind the window of the hall and the door opened. The conclave's breaking at last. I'll go. It was Paul. Helen retreated with the children far into the field. Friendly voices greeted her. Margaret rose to encounter a man with a heavy black mustache. My father has asked for you, he said with hostility. She took her work and followed him. We have been talking business, he continued, but I dare say you knew all about it beforehand. Yes, I did. Clumsy of movement, for he had spent all his life in the saddle, Paul drove his foot against the paint of the front door. Mrs. Wilcox gave a little cry of annoyance. She did not like anything scratched. She stopped in the hall to take Dolly's bow and gloves out of a vase. Her husband was lying in a great leather chair in the dining room, and by his side holding his hand rather ostentatiously was Evie. Dolly, dressed in purple, sat near the window. The room was a little dark and airless. They were obliged to keep it like this until the carting of the hay. Margaret joined the family without speaking. The five of them had met already at tea, and she knew quite well what was going to be said. Averse to wasting her time, she went on sewing. The clock struck six. "'Is this going to suit everyone?' said Henry in a weary voice. He used the old phrases, but their effect was unexpected and shadowy. "'Because I don't want you all coming here later on and complaining that I have been unfair.' "'It's apparently got to suit us,' said Paul. "'I beg your pardon, my boy. "'You have only to speak, and I will leave the house to you instead.' "'Paul frowned ill-temperedly, and began scratching at his arm. "'As I've given up the outdoor life that suited me, "'and I have come home to look after the business, "'it's no good my settling down here,' he said at last. "'It's not really the country, and it's not the town. "'Very well.' Does my arrangement suit you, Evie? Of course, father. And you, Dolly? Dolly raised her faded little face, which sorrow could wither, but not steady. Perfectly splendidly, she said. I thought Charles wanted it for the boys, but last time I saw him he said no, because we cannot possibly live in this part of England again. Charles says we ought to change our name. But I cannot think what to, for Wilcox just suits Charles and me, and I can't think of any other name. There was a general silence. Dolly looked nervously round, fearing that she had been inappropriate. Paul continued to scratch his arm. Then I leave Howard's Inn to my wife absolutely, said Henry, and let everyone understand that, and after I am dead let there be no jealousy and no surprise. Margaret did not answer. There was something uncanny in her triumph. She, who had never expected to conquer any one, had charged straight through these Wilcoxes and broken up their lives. In consequence, I leave my wife no money, said Henry. That is her own wish. All that she would have had will be divided among you. I am also giving you a great deal in my lifetime, so that you may be independent of me. That is her wish, too. She is also giving away a great deal of money. She intends to diminish her income by half during the next ten years. She intends when she dies to leave the house to her, to her nephew down in the field. Is all that clear? Does everyone understand? Paul rose to his feet. He was accustomed to natives, and a very little shook him out of the Englishman. Feeling manly and cynical, he said, Down in the field? Oh, come! I think we might have had the old establishment, Piccaninnies included. Mrs. Cahill whispered, Don't, Paul. You promised you'd take care. Feeling a woman of the world, she rose and prepared to take her leave. Her father kissed her. 
Goodbye, old girl, he said. Don't you worry about me. Goodbye, Dad. Then it was Dolly's turn. Anxious to contribute, she laughed nervously and said, Goodbye, Mr. Wilcox. It does seem curious that Mrs. Wilcox should have left Margaret Howard's end, and yet she get it after all. From Evie came a sharp-drawn breath. Goodbye, she said to Margaret, and kissed her. And again and again fell the word, like the ebb of a dying sea. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dolly. So long, father. Goodbye, my boy. Always take care of yourself. Goodbye, Mrs. Wilcox. Goodbye. Margaret saw their visitors to the gate. Then she returned to her husband and laid her head in his hands. He was pitiably tired. But Dolly's remark had interested her. At last she said, Could you tell me, Henry, what was that about Mrs. Wilcox having left me Howard's end? Tranquilly, he replied, Yes, she did. But that is a very old story. When she was ill and you were so kind to her, she wanted to make you some return, and not being herself at the time, scribbled Howard's end on a piece of paper. I went into it thoroughly, and as it was clearly fanciful, I set it aside, little knowing what my Margaret would be to me in the future. Margaret was silent. Something shook her life in its inmost recesses, and she shivered. I didn't do wrong, did I? he asked, bending down. You didn't, darling. Nothing has been done wrong. From the garden came laughter. Here they are at last, exclaimed Henry, disengaging himself with a smile. Helen rushed into the gloom, holding Tom by one hand and carrying her baby on the other. There were shouts of infectious joy. The field's cut, Helen cried excitedly, the big meadow. We've seen to the very end, and it'll be such a crop of hay as never. End of chapter 44 Recording by Philip Gould End of Howard's End by E. M. Forster